Hey, welcome back to Cool Classics. Today we're going to take a look at the life and career of Dick York, who played Darren Stevens on the ABC TV show Bewitched. There's a lot here to unpack. We're going to do it properly, put it in the correct timeline. I'm sure you do not know some of these facts. Here we go. He was born Richard Allen York, September 4th, 1928 in Fort Wayne, Indiana. He was born right after and during the Great Depression. His parents really struggled during that time, but one thing that they taught him from an early age was that you always share, you always care, and help each other, because it was tough times. And that's what his family did when he was growing up. They shared with everyone else around them. It took a lot of years to recover from the Great Depression. Eventually, his family moved to Chicago. This is when he started to attend Catholic Church on Sundays, and he would go up and sing with the choir. Well, the nuns told him he had a wonderful voice, and this inspired him greatly. He started to think, wow, I could be a singer. And then he was like, I could be an actor. I can do anything. And luckily, he had that motivation, because he went down to CBS, and he started to try out for radio shows, and he landed the part on That Brewster Boy, playing Joey Brewster at the age of 15. Now, this radio sitcom had started the year before on NBC, but once CBS picked it up and recast it with Dick York, it took off. He played Joey Brewster, the mischievous teenage boy, and man, he was a hit. The show ended up going nationwide on CBS radio and into 13 markets in Canada. The show ran from 1942 through 1945, and during this time, Dick got so popular that they were requesting him to be on other shows, and he did so many radio shows, I couldn't list them all. I can't even make sense of it. There's at least 50. But there was something else that he did around the same time that he did even more of, and I mean over 100 of these. They were public service announcements and instructional videos aimed at teenagers. They were shorts, and they were played before the movies in the theaters. In this one, he asks a girl at the high school dance to go for a ride with him, and he tries to show off by going fast and swerving around. And let's just say, it doesn't end well. I've been driving since I was 12 years old. Be careful, Nick. Watch this. Just give him the horn and make him get out of the way. Please, Nicky. This is checking red light, you run. Oh, those things are for old women and scaredy cats. I know what I'm doing. Oh, no, Nick, no, not on the curve. There's another car coming. No, no, Nick, look out! Woo, that was pretty hardcore for the 1940s. Now, the one you see above right now is called Insomnia, and it was made for the Navy, specifically the young recruits that were having a hard time sleeping. I chose this one to show some clips from because it ties into something that I found out about him later on in life that I thought was really interesting. <laughs> Boy, that part about the clock is really... What's the matter, chum? Didn't you like it? Well, that's all funny. You're one of those slap-happy guys. Sleep like a babe, I suppose. Well, why can't you sleep? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe you should take a warm shower before you hit the sack, Bunce. Maybe you don't eat right. Could be the detail you're on's too tough. You know, what you need is... Like I said, there's at least a hundred of these, and they're all about 10 minutes long. But if you go searching for them on the web, they're kind of hard to find. You have to know the name of the short and who put it out, like in that case, the Navy, because they don't go by his name. But there is one on YouTube that you can find. It's called Shy Guy, Dick York. Type that in. It should pop it up. It's about 13 minutes. And yeah, there's a bunch of these. Uh, I don't think I ever will fit in. Not here. I'm different from the guys in this town. So while he was doing all of these short films, he was also on another hit radio show called Jack Armstrong's All-American Boy, and it ran from 1946 to 1951. Now, while on that show, a young lady named Joan Alt would come in and do commercials, and he got to know her, they talked, they hit it off, they started dating. And in 1951, the two of them got married. 
Later that same year, after discussing it with his new wife, they decided he was going to go to New York and try and make it big in show business. This meant, of course, he had to quit the radio station and find a place to stay. So he went off to New York City and stayed at the YMCA. Not wanting to be apart from his wife for very long, the first thing he did was go apply at radio stations, and with his credentials, he was hired immediately. This meant that after about one month, he was able to afford a stable residence and bring his wife Joan into New York with him. He also started performing in the evenings and on weekends on Broadway, and this opened a lot of new doors for him too. Before he knew it, he was on television, which was live television back then. So in 1955, he appeared on stuff like Goodyear Playhouse, the Philco Television Playhouse, Kraft Television Theater, things like that, but he did a bunch of them in one year. He says that he learned so much when he was in New York. This was the best place he could be. They worked you like a dog, but you loved every minute of it. You would go live on the radio, perform your show. Then you would have to come back in three hours and perform it all again live for broadcasting on the West Coast. After that, he would run down the street to a different building and perform live television. Then, that evening, he would go on stage at the Barrymore Theater and perform there. He said it got real hectic a few times when the TV show got picked up for rebroadcast in California. This meant that after he got out of the theater, he had to rush all the way back to the studio and perform at 11 p.m. again for television so it would be live at 8 p.m. in California. He said that he never missed a single show. But sometimes other actors wouldn't show up and you had to ad lib and you never know who was going to miss. So it was kind of like chaos, but controlled, he said. We were professionals and we did it. This is also when he got to appear in his first feature film. It was called My Sister Eileen and it starred Jack Lemmon. And then he played in two more movies with Jack Lemmon, Operation Madball in 1957 and Cowboy in 1958. Then in 1959, he appeared in the movie They Came to Condora, starring Gary Cooper and Rita Hayworth. It was during the filming of this movie when everything in his life would change forever. While filming the scene with Gary Cooper where they're both on a train car, each on their own end pumping the handles up and down to make it go, the director yells cut and a stagehand reaches up and grabs Gary Cooper's side to slow it down, but this added an extra 180 pounds of body weight to it, and Dick was pulling up right then and didn't expect this, and it threw his back out. Dick said the pain was horrible. He had to go lay down and could barely move. Now he kept thinking, I'll feel better in the morning. So when the morning came and he didn't feel any better, then he said, I was mad was like, now I have to be in pain all day at work. I wasn't thinking, uh-oh, there's something really bad wrong here. I was just thinking, it's going to go away. I can tough it out. And that's what I did. I lived with it for years. It would go away for a week. It would come back for a week. But I had no idea just how much damage had been done. Now, Dick only appeared in one more movie after that. It was in the 1960 film Inherit the Wind with Spencer Tracy and Gene Kelly. After that, he said he wanted to focus on television. His goal was to land a reoccurring role on a show. So Joan and Dick loaded up the family. Yes, they had small children at this time, and they moved to California. Over the next four years, he appeared in so many TV shows. Everything from The Millionaire to Dr. Kildare. Father Knows Best to Stagecoach West. But my favorite ones are always the freaky ones. He was on Alfred Hitchcock Presents five different times. Check out a couple of these clips. What do you want? It isn't what I want, it's what Mr. Williams wants. You're just a kid, you don't know what you're doing. That's right, I'm just a kid. Anything you want. Now, what do you suppose would happen if all the fish in the ocean suddenly had the power not to die? Why, in two weeks' time, the ocean would be so choked with fish, there wouldn't be enough water left, all fish would die. Young man, I don't quite know what you're saying, but I know I don't like it. Turn me around. (laughs) 
He was on two episodes of The Twilight Zone, The Purple Testament and A Penny for Your Thoughts. That's a freaky one. He can hear what other people are thinking. If you get a chance, you should go watch it. He was in an episode of The Untouchables called The White Slavers. This one also stars Nita Talbot, who played the White Russian on Hogan's Heroes, who I made a video on and I love. Hey, Ernie, your brother Meg's looking for you. Ernie? I just wanted to say how sorry I am about Mary Sage. Yeah. When's the funeral gonna be? It's, uh, it's up to the city. They got her body. You gonna let the city bury her? You ain't gonna claim her? Well, I'm claiming you, Poopsie. Come on, baby. He was also in the Rawhide TV series starring Clint Eastwood. Now, in this clip you see right now, take a good look at the woman. Who is that masked lady? She's behind a veil? She's playing a harem girl, a belly dancer? Well, that's Barbara Eden, before she was Jeannie. And there is a connection between Bewitched and I Dream of Jeannie. I go into it in the Barbara Eden video that I made. But isn't that a wild clip to find? In 1962, he landed the role of Tom Caldwell on a brand new series called Going My Way, starring Gene Kelly. And it went on for a little while, but it only lasted 30 episodes. So that put him back on the grind and back to more auditions. Well, one of those auditions came in 1964. Dick said he showed up to the studio and was waiting outside the office when Elizabeth Montgomery was sitting in another chair and she was reading a book. He started to talk to her about something in the book and then he realized who she was and he said, I just seen you in that Boris Karloff movie with Tom Poston, Masquerade. You were really good in it. They make some chit chat and he asks her if she's up for a role on the same show that he's there for. And she says yes, but little did he know, she already had the role. And her husband, William Asher, was the director who later became the producer of the show. There was something else he didn't know. Elizabeth had already been rehearsing her lines with Dick Sargent, who had been cast as Darren on the show. But he had too many conflicts with his schedule, he had to back out at the last second. So that's why they were still doing auditions. So when he walked in the room, he said, I was full of confidence. I'd just done so many other you know, shows. I felt like this is it. And I went in and did the lines great with her. Of course, she had rehearsed them like crazy. She was perfect. And when I got done, I said, I don't know about you guys, but if you don't hire me, you got to hire her. And everybody laughed. A couple days later, he got the phone call. He was hired to play the part of Darren on the new show, Bewitched. The strangest things have been happening. I took one glass of champagne and suddenly I found myself... Let's sit down and talk. <laughs> You're a what? I'm a witch. I am a witch. A real, house-haunting, broom-riding, cauldron-stirring witch. It must be the champagne. Nope, it's not the champagne. He really married a witch, and her entire family doesn't like him, especially her mother. I, well, I shouldn't say that. Aunt Clara is very good, and I made a video on her, too. Now, <laughs> they torture Darren in this show. It just goes on and on. If anything could go wrong to someone, it's him. Here it is, Endora. I'm so glad I had one in stock for you. These little truth cards are hard to find. And may I see it, Agatha? Of course. Oh, it's a dear little thing. Oh, uh, how powerful is it? If a human comes within three feet of it, he'll just have to say what's on his mind. Oh, splendid. I'd rather my son-in-law didn't know it was from me. I'll call him right away, Miss Thatcher. <laughs> Mr. Burke wants to know if you've done anything on his advertising campaign. I haven't done a thing. I'd better tell him I had the chicken pox or something. No, I haven't. Not a darn thing. 
To tell you the truth, I haven't been able to work up any enthusiasm for your product. <laughs> now look, Mr. Burke, we have a lot more important clients than you, and <laughs> the same to you, buddy. Am I mistaken, or did you just throw an account out the window? Yeah, I did, and it's about time, too. What's the matter with you, Darren? An account's an account. Dick said the show is based on a love story. Despite the odds against them and all of the opposition, the two of them stayed happily married. And this could only work out if he could play the part lovingly towards her. And he said, I really did love Elizabeth. Some people have heard me say that and taken it way out of context. When the lights go down and the cameras turn off, we all go home to our real family. But we know that we love each other and we have a family here too. The whole cast really cared about each other. When we heard that Alice Pierce, who played Gladys Kravitz, was sick, we were all devastated. And every time Marion Lorne was on set, we watched over her because she was our aunt too, not just Aunt Clara on the show. As my back injury progressively got worse, the cast and crew treated me like a prince. The crew literally carried me on set and off before. They had me sit in a chair, and instead of getting up and moving, they lifted the whole chair up and moved me to the other room. Even the producers and writers went to great lengths to accommodate me. If I was having a bad week, they rewrote the script to where I would be laying in bed or sitting on the couch for scenes. A few times, it was so bad, I told them, just write me out of the episode. They always said no, 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 and just worked around it. This was a lot of extra work for them. I felt like such a burden, but they showed me love and compassion, and I'll never forget that. The day that I collapsed on the set and had to be taken to the hospital, I knew that it felt way different. Then when the doctors came in and told me everything that was wrong and what I would be going through in the next year, I knew there was no way I could return. So when William Asher, the director, came in to visit me, I asked him, is there any way I can leave the show without ruining everything for everyone else? And he said, Dick, we're worried about you. Don't worry about us. We will figure it out. You have to get healthy. So the show continues on. The producers contacted Dick Sargent to see if he was available. He was their original choice all those years before to play Darren. He was, and he came on, stepped into the role, and there was no mention on the show that this was a different person. They just acted like nothing ever happened. But something that was happening was that Dick York was going through multiple surgeries and having a lot of pain for a lot of years. After 18 months of being bedridden, he was finally able to start to move a little bit, but now he had a new problem. All the painkillers that they had been giving him over the course of those 18 months, he became addicted to them. And he'd said, I never drank, so I didn't have any addiction problems other than my smoking, and I never tried to quit that. I was actually up to three packs a day. So when they stopped giving me the pain pills, I was like some junkie or something, and I was having massive withdrawals and I didn't know how to handle it. And it was cold turkey and very hard on me. It took over a year before I started to shake it all off. He said that after that, he still couldn't sleep right for years. But what he found out was whenever it rains, he sleeps better. And he thought that has to be the sound of it. It must be soothing to me. So he set up a tape recorder and recorded hours of raining and he would play that at night and he said I could fall asleep to it. Now I find that interesting because now they have apps for that and on YouTube there are hundreds of videos of just rain. It is calming and soothing to people. So he was ahead of his time there. Now as the years went on Dick was feeling better but he wasn't in any shape to go back to work. Luckily, he did save some money and he had bought an apartment building, which they rented out to families and that brought in a little bit of income. But as the 70s came on and the economy kind of went down, the people were having problems paying him rent on time and he had got to know them for over a decade and he couldn't turn them out. He let them stay there. Instead, he was taking his savings and paying the mortgage on the building and letting them live there for free for years. 
By the time the early 80s came around, Dick needed to go back to work. He landed a role on Simon and Simon and then on Fantasy Island. But by then, he had a new problem. Emphysema. From all those years of smoking three packs a day, it caught up to him. He couldn't breathe, he had to be on oxygen, and this just ended any hopes of a comeback on television. He ended up having to sell the apartment building and taking any equity that he had in it and living off of it for the next few years. Then his wife's mother got very sick and the two of them moved to Michigan to live with her and help her in her final years. Shortly thereafter, Dick was bedridden once again. This time it was due to his emphysema and difficulties breathing. Now he was receiving $650 a month from the Actors Guild Pension Fund and he said they were relying on that money, but they were getting by. He didn't want anything extra, but he wanted to be productive and help other people. So he started a organization from his bed called Acting for Life. He said, basically, I found a food pantry and a homeless shelter that I believed in, and I wanted to get money to them to help the people that were desperate. So I would call people and I would introduce myself as Dick York, and I would talk to them. Sometimes they knew who I was, they got a big kick out of it, and we could chat about the show and good times, and then I would ask them if they would please make a donation and help the homeless people. And maybe they would send them $100, maybe they could send them 20. Anything helps. I never wanted or took a dollar of this money. I had them send it directly to the people that needed it. I had a really good life. My body gave out on me. There are people out there that have it way worse than I do, and they need the help now. During these same years, Dick also wrote a book called The Seesaw Girl and Me, and it's about his wife, Joan, who stood with him and took care of him through all the ups and downs of life. The two of them raised five healthy children, and he said he couldn't be happier or more proud to say that she was his wife. Now their son, Chris York, who's on the left of your screen, did an interview with Herbie J. Pilato over on his YouTube channel. And Herbie's a wealth of information on Bewitched and a lot of shows. He's written books, so go check it out. Well, in this interview, Chris says that he was still a young kid while his father was on Bewitched. And him and his brother didn't really know that his dad was on a TV show. They were still little. But his dad would come in every day and he'd play with the whole family, tell jokes, have dinner. And anytime he could, he would bring home something from the set that was like a neat prop or whatever for the kids to play with. And he would also wear home stuff from the set. And he remembers the day that his dad wore in the big ears on his head, which is a very famous episode. And he said the kids were running around going, Dad, your ears are so big. And he said, my father played it off perfectly. He's like, I don't know what you're talking about. It. He walked over to the mirror, would look in and go, no, I don't see it. They look fine to me. The kids are screaming, your ears, your ears. And he played it off all night long. And the next day when they woke up, everybody rushed to see his ears. And they were back to normal. And his dad said, I never did see anything wrong with them. Now, sadly, on February 20th, 1992, at the age of 63, Dick York passed away from complications due to emphysema. His wife, Joan, was right by his side. Wow, what a story. I hope I did him and his career justice by making this. I tried really hard. If you could, please give it a thumbs up and leave a comment down below. Let me know. I also made a video on Marion Lauren who played Aunt Clara on Bewitched. You're probably going to want to check that out. Stick around and subscribe to Cool Classics.